So I've heard that you think the Internet of Things is broken. Why is that? Absolutely. So right now, most of the architectures you're seeing in the IoT are built around the assumption that there is a person inside the conversation. So uh, at some point during the process, you know, you're going to push a button and the lights are going to go on or they're going to go off. And, and that person is assumed in the architectures. It's not really about automation or autonomous systems. It's about remote controls. And don't get me wrong, remote controls are, are good. That means I don't have to get off a couch to change the television channel. But it's not an internet of things because it's not really an internet of things. It's not things talking to one another. It's things talking to people. And if it's not the things talking to one another, that means that the the person in the system is the person making decisions. We're being informed, we're making better decisions because we have information, but it really does mean that you have all these decisions layered upon you. We've become mechanical Turks in our own software, or worse yet, other people's software. So one of the things that seems to be popping up with the Internet of Things is that all these devices also have custom apps. Yes. Which means you're basically popping open a whole bunch of apps to manage whatever you want to manage. How do you see that playing out? So, please tell me it's going to stop. I really hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, do you remember the point where you had this big pile of physical remote controls yeah, yeah, and yeah. Been next to your mm -hmm. couch? It was like, you know, one for your TV, one for your DVD player, one for your VCR, one for whatever else you had, sure. your satellite box. That got old really, really quickly, right? It's like, that really got old. And today's equivalent is an iPad with 30 or 40 apps because I, I do IoT stuff, so I have 30 or 40 apps because I have all the things, right? And, um, and you know, you, and you have three types of smart light bulbs or whatever, and all of these things have their own app, and a lot of them are backed by a, a different cloud service. And, you know, half your house can be down if your internet connection isn't working, right? That's insane. It's just totally insane. So, yeah, I think it has to stop. It, it, it can't continue because... Again, this is the remote control analogy, right? It's the fact that we're not building things talking to other things, we're building things talking to people, which I, I don't think is sustainable. Um, are there any companies or anybody out there who's headed in the right direction with this stuff? So that's a, that's a complicated question with uh, deeply layered answers or a really short one, which would you like? <laughs> Let's start with short, no. see where it goes. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. No, absolutely not. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that have partial solutions. I, I see a lot of people doing bits of the solution correctly. But as you know, there's a huge emerging standards war kicking off right now. It's like there's the All Seen Alliance, there's the Open Interconnect something or other, there's the IEEE of their own standards, there's the, the Thread Alliance, or it could just be Thread, I can't remember. Whose most prominent member is, of course, Google wearing their Nest hat. There's companies like Samsung, they're actually members of more than one of these alliances because possibly they don't, they want to be on the winning side. Hedging their bets, yeah. Or sure. possibly it's like the left-hand division doesn't know what the right-hand division is doing True. and yep. they're more concerned about their internal conflicts, I don't know. But yeah, there's a huge emerging standards where no one knows how that's going to shake out at all. Um, I mean, my bet for an Internet of Things standard is actually some startup that no one's ever heard of yet. Interesting. So you've got a talk called Data is a Local Problem. What do you mean by that? So basically I'm going to tell all the cloud people here at Strata that they're wrong. Um, because that's fun. You like to hear that? Yeah, I like, I like doing things like that. Um, so what I'm saying is that as, as our smart devices evolve, as you know, everything you wear, everything you carry with you becomes smart and network enabled, the amount of data that is generated is just going to be too big is you can't push all this up into the cloud. Um, I mean, the end, the end game for this is, is something called Smart Dust, which is like a DARPA vision from the early 90s, which is, is effectively millimeter scale compute sensors, energy harvesting that literally floats in the wind. It sort of settles on your skin, it's ingested, it monitors you inside and out. And, and that's almost inevitably where we're heading. We're heading to where your data exhaust isn't a, a figure of speech, it's a cloud of data and sensors that surround you and travel with you. And at that point, the amount of data that's generated is just, 
inconceivably larger than today and the amount of data we have today is inconceivably larger than we had yesterday and th there's no way for that all to be pushed down increasingly limited network connections into the cloud and have it processed there and analyzed there and I think as, as we move forward, as, as the technology changes, the amount of data that we have locally that must be analyzed and acted on locally, local decision making, is going to increase. And in fact, I think a lot of the data is, is going to start being thrown away. And it's already something that's um, come up in science. So you know my, my background is in astrophysics. There's a, there's a telescope being built in Chile, going, going to go online probably in the 2020s, called the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And their entire data architecture is built around the fact that they're going to throw most of the data away on the mountaintop because it's just physically impossible to ship it off the mountaintop down across the Atacama Desert to, you know, the rest of the world. And I think that increasingly for the Internet of Things and the smart dust vision beyond it, that's what's going to have to happen. A lot of the data is just going to be thrown away. Over the years, we've occasionally talked about embedded devices. I'd like to get your take on the latest fitness trackers and watches, what, you, yeah. what, what do you see happening there? So, I, I'm ambivalent about these sort of things, right? So, I think, I think the smartwatch revolution, the smartwatch sort of trend is interesting because I think it illustrates something that, that a lot of the technology companies haven't quite got yet which is that these sort of devices have to be invisible, right? They can't be lumps of technology. They're not about that. It's like the technology is only mature when it's invisible. This is, this is something I've thought for a long time. And I think right now the watches look like the, the, the clunky calculator watches we had in the 80s, right? <laughs> You remember those? I remember the one that could play Pac-Man. Oh, yeah, that okay. one. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> but but it was it was like a novelty. It wasn't something. I mean, do people still watch get wear calculator watches? No. So they weren't useful. They weren't something that was solving an actual problem. And I see a bunch of smartwatches around now that aren't wearing problems. And there's actually, you know, people stopped wearing watches for a long while, except as a, an ornament. But I actually see a lot of watches coming back in now, not smartwatches, like actual old, you know all-style analog things and that's a fashion thing because the technology is invisible and at that point it's just fashion and I think when the smartwatches get to the point where they're actually fashionable and you see Apple trying to move on this right now it's like it's they're pushing it there was a whole bunch of fashion journalists at the Apple watch launch which is is I think is one of the first signs that people are starting to get this despite the fact that I don't think the Apple watch is particularly fashionable I don't think it's particularly nice mm. I think the um, the customization at scale Thing. You know how they, they had a whole different bunch of bands, a different bunch of surrounds. That's an interesting thing that they, I think they're sort of getting it there. And I think all of the fitness trackers, the, the Fitbits of the world, have the same inbuilt problem. It's when it gets to the point where it's you'll wear it as a piece of jewelry, if you wear it as an ornament, I think then it's reached the point where it's going to become ubiquitous. It's going to go beyond the small sort of niche market that they currently have. Last question for you. What people or projects are you watching these days? So, I'm obsessed with Kickstarter. Absolutely obsessed with Kickstarter. <laughs> um, to the point where it's like, I, uh, it's the, the amount of money I'm spending on Kickstarter is unhealthy. Um, and I'm obsessed with it because it's a place where innovation is happening. It's a, a lot of the bigger companies are, are putting out smaller versions of this or faster versions of that. But on Kickstarter, you can actually see some real new products, like new niches starting to form. And I think that is a, a really interesting thing. I mean, so, some of the stuff you see on there is insane. I mean, that's just totally never going to go anywhere beyond the 200 people right at the very end of the long tail that are going to buy it. Mm -hmm on Kickstarter and then that'll be it, it'll be done. But some of it, I think, is actually, um, stands a chance to really generate new pro uh, product categories. So yeah, I'm obsessed with Kickstarter because I think right now, especially in the IoT space, in the internet thing space, that's where the innovation is happening. Interesting. Well, thanks for being with us, appreciate it. No worries.